Amen. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Play skillfully with a loud noise. And I try to make my noise very loud. If I'm going to make a mistake, I'm going to make a mistake hard, fast, and mean and use my elbows doing it. Well, tell God thank you for the rain. Amen. Fills the water wells up, waters the grass and the garden, and all the crops that are grown in this area. Gives all the animals something to drink. Amen. Showers of blessings. God said that his doctrine distills as the dew, as the rain comes down from, think of where rain comes from, comes down from heaven. That's God sending his word down to us. The water of his word sent down from heaven is what that means. I like that. Amen. Speaking of rain and floods, I mentioned this this morning and I'm going to follow up with it uh, concerning the typology of Noah's ark. And uh, so we're going to start out in Acts 28. Go ahead and turn your Bibles there. And just appreciate everybody uh, coming out tonight in these storms. Um, continue to pray for uh, Sister Betty Forsyth. Uh, just the loss of her husband. Her grandson staying with her this week, but he lives down in Florida. And so he'll be leaving Thursday. And I told her, I said, when that house gets quiet, it'll really set in. And I said, just kind of be prepared for it. Grief comes in waves. When we grieve, when we mourn over somebody, it comes in waves. The first few waves are pretty hard. After that, it tends to die down a little bit. They don't come as often. And uh, a lot of people, that's what they experience. And so, um, just try to help her and encourage her. And I told her, I said, a lot of the ladies here know what you're going through. They're, they're going through it now. So, amen, praise the Lord. Acts chapter 28, let's read this, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll find out whether or not we believe the Bible or not. Amen. Acts chapter 28, verse 22. The Bible says, But we desire here of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Get used to that. Get used to that from here on out. In our own, in a nation that used to be a Christian nation. Get used to the true Bible believers being spoken against. Okay? Uh, because we're not going to be tolerant of open practicing sin like it's okay with God. Sin is, I mean, believing in sin is wrong is one thing. Confessing our sins to God, that's what we believe in. But if you don't think you're wrong and you're not told you're wrong, you don't repent. You don't confess. You just, you just believe everything's okay with what we're doing. And um, my mind keeps going back to this church that I mentioned uh, up there on Richardson Road that has openly practicing married sodomites working in the church, teaching the children. There is a church down in Lebanon that we would pass on our way to uh, Brother Uter's church. And the church signed one of these community fellowships or whatever that said, come as you are, we won't judge. And basically what that, mean, what that says is, no matter what sin you practice, we won't say anything about it. We won't say anything about it. We'll let you keep practicing sin and we'll tell you that you're okay with God and it's not okay. So... Those, and it's already happening up in Canada. Canada is enforcing some of its laws against hate speech, which includes things that churches say about their, their prime minister is an Obama liberal, very liberal. And he is wanting his government to crack down on preachers. Get used to it. That everywhere it is spoken, spoken against. In verse 23, and when they had pointed him a day, there came many to him, uh, to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning 
till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Get used to that as well. Out of the people that hear the messages that come out of this church and other churches like ours, some people believe them, some people don't. And I have learned that unless God changes their mind, they're, they're not going to be changed. And that's all there is to it. I, I, would, I would like for everybody that ever listened to one of my sermons, that everybody would listen to it and say, you know what, that's the word of God, I'm going to believe that. But that's, that is not the case. And sometimes people's heads are pretty hard. And so God has to open their eyes. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask God to bless his word tonight, sanctify it in our hearts, and teach us that we can believe what God said. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for the showers of blessings that you're sending down today. And Lord, we, it reminds us of your doctrine and your word that comes down from heaven. It is the water by which Jesus cleanses and sanctifies his bride, the church, with the water by the word of God. And Father, we thank you that we know, Father, that your word has come down to us from heaven. And God, you are visiting with us this very night where we live, where we are. Your Holy Ghost is dwelling inside of us. Your word, Lord, is being read and believed by your saints everywhere. And Father, we rejoice in that. We understand, God, that we're approaching darker and darker and darker days. How long it will take, I don't know. But we can see the sun setting upon Bible Christianity in this country and many other countries around the world. And it'll be just a matter of time before the true Bible believers are spoken against. But Father, encourage us always. Help us, Lord, to be here for one another, encouraging one another, which is what you commanded. And Father, ever so much the more as we see the day approaching. So, Lord, give us training, give us encouragement, give us wisdom out of your word. Father, help us to realize our place in you and in your kingdom by teaching us these wonderful things. We pray this in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, very quickly, turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. I, I like to do this um, because I believe in studying Bible prophecy. Uh, even if you don't understand it all, I still like to study it. I don't understand it all. And anybody says they do, they don't. Um, God's word is always going to foreshadow, it's going to tell the future. Some, but we are seeing this through a glass darkly. And so we don't, I don't think any one person or any one group has the whole truth on what's going to happen. But in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36... The Bible says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So we know that God has an appointed day. He's not going to change his mind. By the way, it didn't happen. The rapture hasn't happened. Tribulation hasn't started. There was another blood moon. And so that brings the, the knuckleheads out. And they all, I mentioned uh, this quote-unquote online only pastor by the name of Paul Begley. He made one of these statements about the blood moon and that's going to start this and that's going to start that and that's fulfilling prophecy in the Bible. No, excuse me. When the Bible speaks of this moon turning to blood, it also speaks of the sun being darkened at the same time. Okay? Now, we know that a lunar eclipse, or it was a, yeah, lunar eclipse, is when the earth passes between the sun and the moon, and the lights go out on the moon, because the moon receives its light from the sun. It's how it's designed. And the earth gets in the way. Now, the sun is still lit, and this blood moon happened. In our hemisphere, it was still daylight. On the other side, over in Europe, it was dark, and that's where it happened. We didn't see it here because it didn't happen here. You had to be farther east. You had to be into Europe and, I guess, down in African places like that in order to be able to see it. But we couldn't see it here because the sun was too well lit. All right? 
So that's the problem with these alleged prophecies being fulfilled, is that, yes, the, the moon did turn a bright orange color as, as it eclipsed. However, the sun was still lit. The sun was not darkened, and you did not have stars falling out of the heavens. These things all coincide one another. That's what the Bible clearly says. And so, I, I don't, it was not a fulfillment of scriptures. How many, how many lunar eclipses have there been since Jesus said all these things? Hundreds, maybe thousands of them. And it's just, I just don't jump on that stuff and say, here we go, it's rapture, it's going to happen any second now. And obviously these guys are wrong, but they will never admit it. You'll never get them to admit it. They'll never apologize for the lies that they told. And so anyway, um, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but, but my father only. So he's speaking of a future, of a future event. And then he says in verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. So what he's doing is he's saying an event in history is foretelling an event in the future. Now, as Bible believers and Bible students, we don't have a problem with this. We don't have a problem believing that the fountains of the great deep opened up, the windows of heaven were open, and for 40 days and 40 nights, water nonstop coming out of the skies, coming up from the earth, literally covered the land mass of the entire earth. Not one rock was stayed dry. Everything got covered. The Bible says the highest mountain, 15 cubits above the highest mountain. Now, I don't know that Mount Everest at that time was the highest mountain. We don't know how high that was. But when the Bible says it covered the entire world, then it means it covered the entire world. So my, my point always is this. If we can't believe what the Bible says about what happened in the past, then why would we believe what the Bible says hasn't happened yet? Because if you can't, if you can't handle the Bible's accuracy in history, then the Bible's accuracy in prophecy means nothing to you as well. And here's what I have found. A lot of the... Theologians, a lot of the Bible teachers, Bible preacher, whatever, a lot of the ministers in a lot of these mainline denominational churches that are liberal, they don't believe the Bible's right about the past, and they don't believe the Bible gets everything right about the future. They allegorize most everything, and some even teach that Jesus has already made his second return. That's stupid. It's stupid. So I'm right. These people who don't believe the Bible about the past, they really don't believe the Bible about the future either. But how then can we expect to go to heaven? If the Bible's not right and God lied about what happened in the days of Noah, if God got it wrong and this is story a man made up, then why did Jesus say, as the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man? Jesus himself said... Everything that you read in the book of Moses is true. Moses wrote Genesis. How did Moses write Genesis? Was he there? No. The Holy Ghost told him. Gave him every word. I mean, he's 40 years in the wilderness. He's got time to do it. Because most days they're just sitting there, camped out. So Moses is writing scripture. And, so, and this is what gets me. In the book of Deuteronomy is where Moses died. Moses wrote Deuteronomy. Either A, Moses wrote his own death. God, really? Is that how it's going to happen? I mean, I'll write it down. Okay? Or a scribe, possibly Ezra, filled that in. We know that Ezra was a ready scribe in the Lord. So God could have used him to fill in that gap. I don't know. We just know. We just believe that what it says is true. All right? So go to 2 Corinthians 5.17. The reason why I bring this up is we mentioned this morning in Romans 7 and Romans 8 um, about therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And the question was, what does it mean to be in Christ? And I said, being in Christ is like being in the ark. If you are in the ark, you're safe. 
So 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Just we'll, and we'll cover some other verses here in a little bit. But it says, therefore, if any man be where? In Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And what I have here is an actual photograph of the ark during the days of the flood. The guy that took it, that was the last picture he ever took. Moses found the camera and hand... No, I'm just kidding. Um, don't know what the ark looked like, but the word ark means box. You have the ark of the covenant, and that's a box is what it is. And the ark of Noah, the ark of Moses, the ark of Moses was basically a box that his sister made, or his mom, and he put little baby Moses in, sent him down the river in a, in a handmade shoebox is what it was. Okay, made an ark of bulrushes. Well, here we have a big box where all of the animals are. And so, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And when you think about the story of the flood, the flood cleansed the earth. Showers have a cleansing effect. They'll clean up the streets. They'll clean your cars off a little bit. Get all the bug guts off and get all the dust off of your car temporarily. And when showers come down, it is God washing and scouring the earth. And everything's clean for a while. And what happened in the flood was God cleansed the earth. He purified the earth by washing it in water. And he cleaned all of the wickedness off. He cleaned all the sinfulness off, or most of it. Uh, and he cleansed basically the entire earth. And so when Mo, Noah finally steps off the ark, it's literally stepping, like stepping into a brand new world. Because for a year now, the earth has been covered with water. So as Moses steps off, all of the trees are budding once again. All of the seed that had been tossed by the water all over the earth comes down to the ground well watered. The sun's now out. And buddy, it takes, and it probably didn't take long either for all that good seed with all that wet ground everywhere to, to root down and take off and sprout up. And so literally, it's like Mo, uh, Moses. Noah is walking into a brand new world. All right? It's like that feeling after a, you've worked all day, you're nasty, you get in the shower, you clean off real good. You're, it's like, boy, I feel like a new person. Okay? Well, you are until the next dirt okay, comes along. But anyway, that's what it was. And so, to me, this 2 Corinthians 5.17 speaks of the story of Noah and the flood in its doctrine. It, we are in Christ, meaning we are like Noah in the ark. We are saved and we are safe. Now that ark undoubtedly rocked. It undoubtedly had to endure the waves. Some guys several years ago built a scale model of an ark and they made it basically just like a rectangular box. And they took it to some lab where they do tests on boats. And they put that thing down in that wave pool to see how it, w it would withstand waves. And they brought it down to scale and they put it in this wave pool and they said, there is literally no way to capsize that boat. The way it was designed, the way it was, the length of it, basically, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go long ways as the waves come in. Because of the way it was designed, the waves are going to make sure that the, the length of the boat is pushing into the waves instead of being sideways. And the waves coming at it like that, it's basically going to turn the whole thing around and make sure that the waves do not capsize that boat. God knew what he was doing. You figure, who's got knowledge of shipbuilding in Noah's day? Nobody does. Nobody built one. Noah was the first one built. And when, when he followed the instructions of God, here's my point on this. Our life is going to get rocky every now and then. But we're in Christ. He's not leaving us. We're not going to leave him. We have, as Noah put his confidence in that ark to save him and all the seed of the animals alive, so we have put our confidence in Christ, knowing 
that if we stay in Christ, we're not only saved, but we're safe. Okay? And so I want you to keep that in mind. Now let's go to Genesis 6. Turn there. So what is the symbolism of the ark? Christ. Think of Christ as the ark. And as, as with anything or anybody that is saved, doesn't matter what time it was, as is true for everyone who is saved by God, it is always by God's grace. Always. Genesis 6, verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and the creeping thing, the fowls of the air. How many are there? How many things are there? It's four. Okay. This is, I want you to think of typology. I want you to think of the future. There is a kingdom coming. In the book of Daniel. Fourth kingdom. And that fourth kingdom is like the flood of iniquity in the last days, all right? And God's going to destroy all the wickedness out of the earth. He's going to do it so that he can come and reign on the earth for a thousand years. So look at both man, beast, the creeping thing, fowls of the air, as God in the future destroying all of the wicked men, all of the wicked beasts, the beast himself, all of the evil angels, a third of them, they're now cast down to the earth during that time and God's going to destroy them all. So that when Christ comes to reign, he's put down all principality and powers and he's locked Satan up in prison for a thousand years and you could say it's going to be really easy for him to do what he's going to do for that thousand years, all right? He doesn't... There could be an election every year, and since nobody else, Satan's not running against him, he's going to win it every year, all right? So anyway, but Noah found grace, for it repenteth me that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That right there is what precipitates anybody being saved. We do not come to Christ on the basis of our good works, on the basis of, well, I, I'll get saved, but I want to start going to church first and get right, then I'll get saved. You got it backwards. You get saved. God will then start working your life, making things right for you. That's how it works. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So that is what always precipitates. If you're in Christ, you are in Christ, not according to how good you are. You're in Christ by God's grace and His grace alone. So, so, but then when you look at Genesis 6, you see that God gives Noah the instructions on building the ark. And that has caused some people to say, well, obviously Noah was saved by his works because he built the ark. Again, he found grace first. God then instructed Noah on building the ark and how to build it. If Noah does not believe God, he won't build it. And he'll perish. God will find another Noah. But Noah believed God. It's grace through faith. And what Noah believed caused him to prove what he believed by what he did. That's the book of James in a nutshell. He, he found grace. God looked on all the people of the earth. You're all wicked. You're all going to perish. I got one guy here that I love. And he's been pretty clean. And I, I know he's not perfect, but I'm going to save him. So he finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. God gives him the instructions, gives him his word. Noah believed unto righteousness. Noah believed. And because Noah believed, that's what caused him to build. To, even if it takes 120 years, we're going to build this thing, okay? I believe God blessed it the whole way. I believe his yoke was easy, and I believe his burden was light. I'm not sure exactly how Noah got all the beams laid out. I don't know how, what cranes he had. I don't know, but maybe God sent him a herd of elephants to help him build that ark, okay? 
Here, lift this beam here. And the elephant just lifted the beam up there. However, he did it. I believe his yoke was easy and I believe his burden was light. I think every piece just fell into place like, wow, this is easy. <laughs> I could build 20 of these, all right? But he built one. So we have Noah showing his faith by his works. You're not saved by works. You're saved by faith. But if it's not a true faith, you're not saved. Because it'll all be, always be exhibited. We are his workmanship, created unto God for good works. He created us. He gave us, he made us a new creation. Why? So we could do good things in this world. Amen. Now look at Genesis 7. Chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Why did God see Noah as being righteous? Because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he believed God, just like Abraham did, and God imputed righteousness to him. Noah was a sinner, just like everybody, every other man is. And we see his sin after the flood, right? Because he gets drunk. That may have been something that was in him the whole time. But he believed God, God imputed righteous, and God sees Noah as being righteous. So verse 2, of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. I think that's Israel. Then he said, um, his male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, I see that as the Gentiles. We're like, that's what God showed Peter when he lowered the sheet down. He had all these unclean animals on there. And he said, Peter, what I have cleansed, call not thou unclean. And then Peter understood that God was referring to the Gentiles. So then Peter goes and he's the first one to minister to the Gentiles with the gospel. So then verse 3, of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and his and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. God's preserving his word in the form of DNA. Because that's his book. Your DNA, the DNA of monkeys, the DNA of hippopotamuses, and water buffaloes, and dogs and cats, and everything, and chickens. God preserved his word in the form of their DNA. God preserved it with the ark. And so for, and then he said, verse four, for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. How long did it last? Exactly 40 days and 40 nights to the second, I believe. Okay. Like old faithful, the water started this exact day, the seventh day from when he said this. And, um, and every living substance that I've made, will I destroy from off the face of the earth? And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Why did he do it? Because he believed God. If he didn't believe God, he wouldn't have done it and he would have perished. Now, look at verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month. Interesting to me why God gives the exact month, the exact date. It's interesting. I don't know what it means. I really don't, but it's interesting to me. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days, 40 nights. That's exactly what God said. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his son with them into the ark. So seven days prior to that, God gives the commandment, Noah, get thee and all the animals into the ark. So realistically, it took seven days to get them all in there because Noah and his family are the last ones in there. They went, think about it. They went in the same day that it flooded. Same day that it started, okay? There's a, how can I say this? You're going to die at the exact moment that God's going to take you into heaven. Amen? You're going to die at the exact time God has planned to take you into heaven. Okay? So, Noah and his family do not go into the ark until the exact time God's ready to destroy the earth. That's when he saves them. Does that make sense? Okay? Would it have done, would it, would it have been better for Noah and his family to get on the ark and wait seven days? No. Why? You've got seven days. Get all these animals on the ark and if you get done early, enjoy the time that you've got. 
Okay, roll around in the dirt because you're not going to see dirt for a long time. But anyway, that's what happens. Same day, they get on the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind and every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Very important to remember. Noah did not close the door of the ark. Noah could not have. He was instructed to build the door. But at no time did Noah think, Lord, when do you want me to shut the door? God's like, Noah, don't worry about it. Because when I'm ready, I'm going to shut the door. And I believe that a raindrop starts falling down from heaven and God shuts the door as that first raindrop hits. Okay? Why not? Because that's what God did. He shut him in. Uh, in Revelation, turn there, underline this in your Bible, and you make a little note here to, that I think it links to Genesis 7. Links to a lot of other things in the Bible as well. But here's the thing you need to remember about being in Christ. You did not get in there by your own works. And you're not kept in there by your own good deeds. Okay? Think about it. When we're saved, we remain saved by grace through faith. You know what I believe? I believe salvation is a life of you, you continue to believe what God said. You don't just quit believing and then say, well, I'm still saved. I just don't believe in that stuff anymore, but I'm still going to heaven, even though I don't want to. Okay, I don't go for that stuff. I don't go for this. Well, they're going to get more rewards. And so on. I don't know. Uh -uh. The reward is God. God told Abraham, I am thy exceeding and great reward. You have God. What else do you need? Amen? I mean, isn't that our testimony? I have Jesus. What else do I need in this world? And so, Revelation 3, 7, Unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. And this was actually a prophecy in Isaiah. He that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. So who closed? Who is the Lord that closed the door? It was Jesus. It was Jesus. The Lord shut him in, which means that God put Noah and his family in the ark. God is the one who shut the door. And all of the waves of that flood had no power to open that door back up and cause that ark to sink. Remember, Jesus, his preferred method of crossing a sea is to walk across the top of it, right? You can't sink the Lord. So Christ is that ark. And when God has shut you in, you're shut in. God had who he wanted on that ark. He had the number of animals that he wanted. God got it every way that he wanted. And now they're on the ark and now they're shut in. And it's like what Jesus said about being in God's hand. When you're in God's hand, who can pluck you out? Nobody. A church can't say, well, you're not saved anymore. Or a preacher can't say, you're not, you're not righteous anymore. You're not saved anymore. No more than a preacher or a church can say that you're saved. No church or preacher can say you're not saved. And that have any effect with God. If God saves you, you're going to continue in belief and he's going to shut you in. You're sealed until the day of redemption. Okay? Because God's the one who seals it. And think of, think of the book in God's right hand. Who alone is worthy to open the seals? Well, that's Christ. He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. It's just like the little process of your DNA. When your DNA is going to make a copy of itself so that it, you can grow more hair or whatever it is. There's only one thing in the world that can open DNA and read it, okay? That's RNA polymerase. It, it alone can open the seals, the hydrogen bonds of DNA, so a copy can be made so it can be read. And, and I'm not going to get into all that. But anyway, that's how it works, all right? Now, 
Uh, Genesis 8, turn there. So we have, if we follow the Genesis chapter, the number 6 is the number for preparation. And in Genesis 6, Noah prepared the ark. The number 7 is God's number for completion. It's done. And in Genesis 7, for yet seven days, and I will destroy the earth, God stopped that part of the world's history, was ended on that day. The number 8 is the number for new life and new beginnings. So in Genesis 8, look at verse 13. And it came to pass in the 600th year, at 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spoke unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. That's eight people. In Genesis 8, walk out into a brand new world. So, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old world was passed away. God got rid of the giants. God got rid of the wickedness that was on the earth. And we're going to start all over again. Okay? But then more giants show up. So, anyway. It was God who said to Noah, you can now come off. Only God can say that. So verse 17, bring forth with thee every living creature that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, eight people. And every beast, every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And that's, and then we find, uh, if you look at verse 22 of Genesis 8, look at verse 22. You're going to see another 8 here. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night. Eight things here shall not cease. So what that is, it's a foreshadowing of after the thousand year reign of Christ, it's going to be an endless day. Everything then that God replaces the old heaven and the old earth with, it's never going to die, it's never going to be flooded, it's never going to be destroyed, it's never going to be defiled with sin, it's not going to have any more devils in it, it's, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the new creation. And that's what the number 8 stands for. And that's what we were reading in 1 Peter chapter 3, he said where it is eight, eight souls were saved by water. So that number eight is an, a number of everlastingness. How do you draw an eight? And you can just keep going. It's an, you draw an eight with an endless loop. And it just keeps going back and forth, back and forth. It, the, even the design of the number eight shows eternalness, everlastingness. It never stops, okay? And so that's the, that's the idea then that God is teaching us. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Noah and his family, eight people, were in the ark. God made them brand new. God made the earth brand new. And he's starting all over again. Now, that's just the foreshadow. When God does this thing for real in the eighth day, then no more death, no more dying, no more suffering, no more sickness, no more diseases, no more crying, no more sin, no more sea, the Bible says. Nothing, nothing's going to defile, and so everything is going to go on for eternity. And you and I cannot even come close to fathoming eternity, because everything that we know starts and stops. We had a death this week, and we had a wedding this week. Same family. Death in the family, that's life stopping. Wedding, that's a new life starting. Okay? Everything in our, in our mind starts and stops. We cannot fathom eternity. Don't you think we would get bored? No, we're going to be brand new. We're not going to think the way we think now. Poor Caleb, he gets bored so easily. He won't in heaven, amen? So now, let's look at a few verses very quickly. 
and, ha and just keep this in your mind, that being in Christ is like being in the ark. And here's the promises and the things that God does with us. So in the ark equals in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Romans 8. See the number? Romans 8, 1 and 2. That's what we read this morning. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are where? In Christ Jesus. Noah and the seven family members, the eight people were in the ark. God did not condemn them while he condemned the rest of the world. You see that? There's no condemnation to the animals and the people on the ark. While there is condemnation to the rest of the world, Noah and his family are not under condemnation because they are in the ark. Who walk not after the flesh, after the spirit. If Noah walked after the flesh, he would say, you know what? I'm tired. I'm 500 years old. I don't need to be building arks. That may have what his flesh said. But his spirit said, Noah, your family's going to die. Unless you keep this thing going. He did not walk out of the flesh. He walked out of the spirit. For the law of the spirit of, of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And God exhibited that to Noah and his family by not condemning them when God was condemning the rest of the world. Turn to Rome, uh, turn to, look at it, Romans 8, 35. I love this. I love this. Do you remember what day it was that God began the flood? What day was it? Seventeenth day of the month on a Tuesday at nine o'clock. No, I'm just kidding. It was the 17th day of the month. This passage here in Romans 8, 35 through 39, if you count, there are 17 things that cannot keep us from the love of God in Christ. I dare you to count them. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, so now we got seven things. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels. Now we're up to ten. Nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. Seventeen things exactly shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 17 day of the month, 17 things cannot separate us from the love of God. Why? Because we're in the ark. We are in Christ. He has sealed us with his Holy Ghost. And we're not under condemnation. Are you in Christ? That's my question. Romans 12, 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. Christ. See, when God saved one, he saved all eight. Now, here's something to think about. We don't necessarily see God saying of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, I see them righteous. Just Noah. But God wanted to preserve the seed, so he preserves all eight of them. All right? And in the body, all of us are one body in Christ Jesus. In other words, when God saved Noah, he saved the whole lot, the family. When God saves one saint, he saves all the saints. Doesn't matter if you think you're the worst saint in the world, the best saint in the world, the halfway saint of the world. It doesn't matter what part of the body you are. When the body is saved, the whole body is saved. Everyone members one of another, because the foot bone is connected to the head bone. Through the ankle bone, the chin bone, the knee bone, the thigh bone, the hip bone, the back bone, the shoulder bone, the neck bone. I remembered all of them. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Sanctified means purified, cleansed. That means when you're sanctified... You have been made clean from all unrighteousness and uncleanness. You now stand in the presence of God 
And when he sees you, he sees his only begotten son who does not sin. Why? Because when God sees us, who does he see? He looks, he sees Jesus. And where are we? In Christ. Half of the ark did not break off during the flood and they lost half the people. The whole ark all of the animals, and all the people in Noah's family. And think about it. And I, I got this idea that says God is the one who controls birth. God is the one. Because you've got three young couples. Probably with their own little space in the ark. And for some reason, only still only eight people walk off a year later. No births, right? Eight people go on, eight people come off. God controlled births, okay? And God controlled yours. You're not born unless God says you're born. You're not born again unless God says you're born again. Them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place, call upon... The, so who is the church? Is the church just the local church at Corinth? Not according to this verse. Because even though he speaks to the church of God at Corinth, he says they are sanctified, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord, both theirs and ours. So who is the church? It's all of us. All the saints. And I have, I mean, I've got... Brethren in the Lord, they read, we read the same Bible as they do. They say, no, the church is only the local church. I don't see that in the scriptures. What I see is that every one of us are past, present, future. All of these sanctified in Christ are the body of Christ. Christ is always the head of every saint, no matter where they are. Second Corinthians 2, I like this one. Now, thanks be to God. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Flip, 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 flip. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. Where? Raise your hand if you've ever failed God. And yet, Paul said that in Christ, we always triumph. How can that be? Your version of failing God is God's version of conquering sin in your life. Because every time you disobey God, you learn something, don't you? You learn that if you do it again, you're going to get your tail end beat. You learn that if you go against God, He's going to chastise you. You want to do it again? Uh, not anytime soon, Lord, no, uh-uh. Okay? I'm just saying, when Paul said he always causes us to triumph, always, if you're in Christ, God is always triumphing in you and over you. But the Reg preached a sermon years ago, the one thing that I like about it, he, was, he called it chain to the chariot. And how many times did Paul say, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ? And I used to see that as, well, yeah, he was in prison for Jesus Christ. That's not what he said. He didn't say, I was a prisoner for Jesus Christ. I was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Christ nabbed him on the road to Damascus, chained him to himself, and said, Paul... Wherever I go, that's where you're going. And Paul, if I, if, I, if I have to take you dragging, kicking, and screaming, if I want you to go to Corinth, you're going to Corinth. You want to go east? I don't want you to go east, and I'm not going to let you go east. We're going to go west. And so Jesus took Paul west. Every bit of Paul's life, he was chained to Jesus Christ, and wherever Jesus Christ went, that's where Paul went. So what I'm telling you is, your life is no different. 
you are chained, you are a prisoner of Jesus Christ in that sense that he's captured you. And wherever, however you are at this very moment is where God drug you to this very moment. Now sometimes we go willingly, don't we? But sometimes we don't want to go. And what does Jesus do? Pull the chain, drag you over there, this is where you're going to be. Right? So, I'll say it again. On August 24th, if I see myself in Kenya, it's because Christ drug me to Kenya. Once again. And I have trouble going to Kenya. So, again, I'm hesitant about it. But I learned, because one time we were supposed to go, got to the airport, and Christ drug me back home. Said, you're not going. To this day, I do not understand why. But Jesus said, you're not going. And so I didn't go. And that's what I believe. Amen? Wherever you are right now, you're a product of Christ bringing you there. He triumphed in Christ, make manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every... So not only did he say we always triumph in Christ, he said we do it in every place. Why? Because you're chained to the Lord Jesus Christ. Today... He's triumphing. Tomorrow, dragging you where he's going to drag you, he's triumphing. A year from now, he's still triumphing in your life. Okay? For, for we are unto a God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved. Did you think about that. You smell like Jesus to God. Huh? No, 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 no. Yeah, that's right, yeah. But here's how God's, God smells you and he smells his son. There is a law where they made the ointment of the apothecary. They made this, uh, this anointing salve for the, uh, for the tabernacle service. And God gave strict instructions on how to make it. And he said, this is only to be used in the tabernacle by the priest. He said... If any of this is outside of the tabernacle, if it's ever made outside the tabernacle and used, I'm going to kill whoever did it. And we're talking about ointment. But think about it. Christ, the anointed one, David, or the, the oil that poured down Aaron's beard, that was his anointing. Okay? Pouring the oil down and anointing Christ, you and I smell like Jesus, because we are in Christ. I'm going to give you one more, even though I've got 12 more. 2 Corinthians 3, turn there, and then I'll let you go. Looks like it's about cleared up anyway, so it'd be a good time. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 11. Mm, 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 mm. Man, I love this. 2 Corinthians 3.11, For if that which is done away was glorious, he's talking about the law. Remember when Moses came down from Mount Sinai? His face shined so bright with the law in his hand that they couldn't stand to look at him. That's what glory is. Glory is radiating brightness. All right? Matthew used to look at sunbeams coming through clouds. And as a little boy, he said, Mom, that's God's power, isn't it? That's God's power coming down, isn't it? And we were going, yes, he's so cute. Okay? I mean, he was just a boy and he knew this. Okay? It was God's radiating glory coming down through the clouds. And I'm going, I like this kid. Okay? So anyway, glory is God's brightness. And Moses comes down with the law and the law was done away, but it was so bright people couldn't look at Moses. So how much more brighter when Jesus comes back, how much more brighter is he going to be than Moses was? If they, he was so bright, they couldn't even look at him because he was like the sun. Jesus is outshining the sun. <laughs> wow! Seeing then that we have such hope. We use great plainness of speech and not as Moses. What does it mean, not as Moses? Sterling, what was wrong with Moses' speech? Stuttered. We went to a job site one time and the builder had a bad stuttering problem. Well, Sterling has a bad hearing problem, and he chose Sterling to try to talk to. 
And when he finally got a sentence out, Sterling went, what? So the guy had to do it all over again. I'm sorry, what? And I, me and Steve were just going. <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough when you got a stutter. When you're talking to somebody that can't hear, it was bad. Why did Moses stutter? God wanted Moses to not be understood by the Jews. That's why. But now we use great plainness of speech. And we understand what this Bible is. Anybody says, oh, I read that King James. I don't understand it. They're, they're lying. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Which veil is done away where? In Christ. See, we understand now, don't we? We don't keep the law. We're not appointed to keep the law. Christ kept the law. We're in Christ. So if we're in Christ, when God looks upon Christ, he can't condemn us because we're him. Right? Everybody who is in Christ, none of us can be condemned because God does not condemn his only begotten son. And that's where we are. We are in him. So, uh, verse 15, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, because God's going to remove the veil one of these days. The veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. You have liberty in Christ. How many Jewish feast days did you keep? None. How many commandments have you kept? None. None. So we are in Christ. Now, you don't use liberty as a license to sin, but you're free. You've been made free and you're not in the shackles of bondage to the law anymore because you are in Christ. And there's liberty there. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.